What does it mean to be the main character of something? Sounds like a pretty easy question, and for most media, it is. It's the character whose journey you follow, that changes over the course of the story, and who the audience is invested in seeing succeed. They're the protagonist, the hero, the good guy. Unfortunately, as is often the case in art, this gets complicated once you start running into exceptions. In monster movies, what sells tickets isn't the citizens fleeing from Tokyo or the teens getting it on. It's Godzilla giving grave warnings about the environment with nuclear breath, or Jason Voorhees coming to mercilessly slaughter them in hip and inventive ways. Claiming that they're not the main character just because the story isn't told from their perspective feels disingenuous. Because they're still the individuals that the entire plot revolves around. We could say, well, it's the character most prominent in the title of a work, or the most affected by it thematically. But it feels wrong to congratulate The Wizard of Oz or Princess Zelda for their main character status in some of their most famous self-titled works. You run into even more problems if you try to introduce an ensemble cast. Musicals like Cats have something of an emotional through line, but really are mostly about showcasing each character through a song before moving on to the next. And introducing a main character to what's ostensibly a mood piece would feel clumsy, forced, and terrible. Why did I watch it twice? With this in mind, I ask, who is the main character of Final Fantasy VI? Most would call this obvious. It's Terra. She's the first you control, she's the one on the Japanese box art, she's the one Bannon calls the ray of hope for world of balance, she's the one who communicates with the espers to push the plot forward, she's the one that Dissidia Final Fantasy says is the main hero of the game by virtue of her inclusion. But then, Terra is out of commission for a huge portion of the first half of the game, and is entirely optional for the game's second half. Meaning that skipping over her in the World of Ruin could make her entirely absent from the game's ending, with no thematic sense of loss outside of her own arc. Locke, then? He's second in the party, much more talkative, gets the girl, has an adventurous, roguish personality, and gets a solo segment all to himself to be the hero. But like Terra, he's optional on the back nine and does very little taking charge once natural leaders like Cyan enter the picture. And while Cyan is great, he enters the scene a bit late to feel like the main character. And you guessed it, is totally optional in World of Ruin. Okay then, well of FF6's huge cast, who's actually required for the endgame? What members of the party will always be there for that big, bad showdown at the end? Only three. Setzer, Edgar, and Celis. Setzer's a decent choice. Like Locke, he's a bit roguish, his airship is fundamental toward uniting the party through a common goal, and he's the only FF6 character to show up in a Kingdom Hearts game, so clearly he resonated with somebody and his name is Tetsuya Nomura. But... That's about it. He shows up even later than Cyan and fundamentally provides nothing other than a floating boat for everyone to cruise around in. While he's invaluable, Appa isn't the main character of Avatar, and Setzer doesn't fit the bill doing the same thing here. Edgar's got a similar issue, only instead of his focus being on the relationship with the ship, it's his relationship with his brother, Sabin. The two are so intrinsically connected in their own little subplot that Edgar never really gets an opportunity to be the leading man. He contributes a lot, but it's always as a consequence of others' actions. Celis, meanwhile, has some of the best and most memorable scenes in the game. She's the first character you get back in World of Ruin, makes a great foil to the game's main antagonists, and her runic ability directly counters the massive magical power that the villains want to harness. 
Mechanically, she's a slam dunk. But narratively, she's defined by her relations to other characters. A conversation about her that doesn't also include her being Tara's foil or Locke's love interest feels incomplete. While she has a wonderful sequence of force-feeding a man fish and finding hope in even the most dire of situations, Strago gets that same through-line in one mini-scene with Realm, Cyan gets that in his dream with the Three Stooges, Hell, Celis says one line to Setzer and he goes through that same emotional arc in seconds. While this does reflect the ensemble nature of the game and searching for friends, by introducing characters in relation to Celis, you question if they could be protagonists instead, since they appear earlier or have better scenes or have the same through line, since Celis needs them to remain plot relevant, but they don't need her. But then you need Celis to introduce them to World of Ruin so they can't be protagonists, so who's in World of Ruin and Celis is in World of Ruin and now we've gone cross-eyed. So, who do we even have left? Mog, the guy on the US box art, potential Pikachu of the series when Chocobo's feeling lazy. You could kill him before he even becomes a party member. Realm, the emotional core, very little screen time, and the very last character in World of Balance. Gao and Strago, showcasing the battle system, practically joke characters. Shadow, because he owns a dog? Umaro? Go-Go? Train Ghosty Boy? That's the issue with trying to define characters as more or less important than each other. It gets hugely subjective in this case depending on what attributes you pay attention to. Whatever individual hero's journey resonates with an individual player is gonna be the character they gravitate towards. All of them are a main character, but none of them are THE main character. People who say that this is an ensemble cast are closer, but in my mind, don't precisely get what the game's going for. No. There is one clear main character, and it's made obvious from the moment you power on the Super Nintendo. The main character of FF6 isn't anyone you control. It's Kefka. That does defy all conventional wisdom of what a video game should be. You should be the main character, or at least see their journey. That's the whole point of the immersion JRPGs thrived off of. But when has Kefka ever cared about convention? He has a greater quantity of important scenes than any other character. No one has a bigger impact on the plot than he does. He faces the greatest hardship, has the most complete arc even if his attitude never really changes, has the title theme baked right into his boss fight. When people think of Final Fantasy VI, an angelic clown is usually their first thought. And I don't think that it's just because he's an entertaining villain with some good quotes. Though that's definitely a part of it. It's because he makes his presence known more than any other character. Kefka controls Terra with the Slave Crown, robbing her of her sense of self, giving Locke a reason to protect her. Kefka sets fire to Figaro, causing Edgar to act, run into Sabin, and for the whole group to join the Returners. Kefka plans to poison Doma's water supply, which Celis overhears, getting her branded a traitor and starting her arc with Locke. Kefka actually poisons Doma's water supply, inspiring Cyan to look for revenge, leading to encounters with Gao, Shadow, and train suplexes. Kefka starts to burn down Realm and Strago's village, then cuts General Leo down while he's at it. Kefka gains Emperor Gestal's trust, then stabs him in the back and forces the floating continent to come crashing down, beating the game's supposed main villain for the party to fulfill his own goals. 
Kepka ends the world, separates those his actions united, and basks in fear and worship as he thinks about what he can destroy next. At every major plot beat, the little mini-boss that could is there, dancing around, driving it forward. He's not featured in every act for every arc. No. Kefka owns the whole damn circus. The clown serving is the perfect ringmaster who integrates himself into the performance at just the right moments to keep the whole thing together. And through his wicked theater, he becomes an unstoppable god, ruining the entire planet by taking revenge on the man behind his madness. But not really caring. Destruction is far more important than petty feelings or arcs. <laughs> 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 and this single antagonist, this overwhelming force, this really mean clown, is the reason that the heart of Final Fantasy VI shines as brightly as it does. Kefka's actions are pure nihilism, annoyed at the concepts of life and death themselves, seeking destruction and misery wherever possible. It's because of his actions that the party of Final Fantasy VI is able to come together, be friends, find their own personal reasons to hope and to fight. Nowhere is this more obvious than Kefka's own masterpiece of hopelessness, World of Ruin. Because only three party members are required and you could send anyone into the final fight, the back half of the game becomes a very personal and customized experience. Every character has their own arc as you get them back. Their own challenges, their own struggles, their own reason to live. Their own way to defy everything that Kefka stands for. Kefka's not a terribly deep character, but he doesn't need to be, and arguably shouldn't be. He's a dark reflection of Final Fantasy VI, the idealized form of going against its themes of rebuilding, redemption, reunion, and reconciliation, and how ultimately futile his destructive viewpoint is. Kefka intentionally lessens his own power just so he can keep searching for some kind of answer in life. He taunts the party, saying he's going to build a monument to non-existence, clinging to his philosophy desperately despite the very idea making no sense. Causing suffering isn't enough for Kefka. Betraying the Emperor isn't enough for Kefka. Being a god isn't enough for Kefka. Nothing will ever be enough for Kefka. Nothing will ever satisfy him because he's looking in all the wrong places. Kefka is a tragic villain, but not because of the experiments done on him, or the cruelty of society, or even how pitiful his unshakable worldview is. It's that the player themselves have what he never could. Friends, a story, and appreciation for his world. No matter what team you pick, the heroes that most resonated with you, a Celis Edgar Setzer setup to complete the CES challenge, or even a totally wacky team of Gao, Ma, Gumaro, and Gogo, you had your reasons. And no matter how small they were, those were enough. And those small reasons are ones that Kefka could never begin to understand. None of that junk is enough to fulfill your hearts! Destruction! Destruction is what makes life worth living! <sighs> Final Fantasy VI is the rare example of a story told nearly entirely through its antagonist, with characters reacting to him rather than charting their own destiny. Because of this, it's one of the earliest examples of a video game story fully realized, whose themes would remain just as complex and complete as the video games that would enter the market almost 30 years later. Kefka is a special villain. The player's relationship with him is just the same as the characters they control. 
motivated by a desire to prove everything he stands for wrong. Just by playing the game, by caring about the world, heck, by finding Kefka himself amusing, the player fights to prove that their experience is worth something, that the characters in this world mean something. And that's allowed the clown to endure for decades, beyond any other villain of his era who remained in their own self-enclosed story. Just because we're not supposed to empathize with Kefka doesn't mean we can't grow and learn from his experiences. We just have to find our own reasons to live, to care, and to take on the main character of Final Fantasy VI.